Atheist Nomads, episode 249. Congress is throwing us a bone. The podcast you're about to listen to includes cursing and talking about hoo haws. Please be advised. Welcome to the episode of Atheist Nomads. I am Dustin. Joining me as usual is Lauren. Yeah, as u- usual, <laughs> right. Rarely. Usually. Yeah. And Mikey. Hi. Hi. Uh, hey, how's it going, everybody? It's going good. Not banned on Facebook. Nah, unlike fine. some in our company. Banned on banned. Although banned, I, not banned. you totally, you know, you deserve to be banned sure, because it's in protest of their stupid rules. Yeah. I mean, whatever. Facebook sucks. Everyone already knows that. Uh-huh. It's that's like, true. That's not news. Dustin and I <laughs> were discussing this at dinner. It's like, yeah. what, what is even the purpose of Facebook? It's like, well, well they're harvesting not what it our, used to be. Yeah. They're harvesting. It's the Itani Corporation just waiting to... The what? Wait, is it Itani? Itani? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Itani. Yeah, That's it. Itani. Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking Umbrella Corp. <laughs> also Umbrella Corp. Uh, Slightly more disturbing. It's it's all of them. It's just waiting to happen. Yeah. It's um, waiting to reach its, its full happened. fruition. Okay. Wow. Yeah. When they can sway U.S. elections, they could take over a country. The world. Well, newspapers sways elections. I mean, yeah, you can. That's true, and people is, used to argue that yeah. <laughs> the printed word was the devil. Yeah, it's just I think don't just, read, uh, don't fill your mind with sinful images. Yeah, reading knowledge doesn't help. <laughs> don't watch TV. Clearly, knowledge is not. This is the information age, and we just are more stupid people than ever. Yeah, we, we, fine. we I love, don't know like, what to do with like the information. My quote mm-hmm. is: We have the sum of all human knowledge in our pockets, and we use it to watch cat videos. And that describes humanity. I'm not watching a lot of cat videos anymore. No? I mean, it's not like I'm over cats. I'm just on to, like, I don't know, possum videos now. Oh, my God. Possums are so cute. Possums are in. Possums are totally in. Bats. Bats are great. Baby bats. The orphaned bats. bats (laughs) With their little ears there twitching. Yep. Yep. I'm with you. I found a new app today. Yeah. I'm excited about. Oh, God. Yes. He's so excited. It's called Signal. It is a open source messaging application that doesn't want your data. That's what they always say. And it's run by an open source foundation where their goal is helping spread encryption technology. And this is a way for them to showcase it. That's fun. So it's it's really awesome. It handles SMS for people who aren't for the kids. For for people who aren't using signal. And then for the people that are, you have end to end encrypted uh messages Sweet. including voice and uh video messages for all those top secret shopping lists that you're sending to your loved ones yes what yes. we need now is a communication system that skips the cell phone towers since we've already seen evidence of them shutting down cell phone towers in uh, response to civic unrest uh-huh mm. so. well this one if if you're on wi-fi it doesn't need the cell phone tower right um, and it just quick run to starbucks sms sucks that's yeah. basically all Starbucks is good for now. Yeah. Uh, text messaging, uh, standard SMS text messaging was great in 2002 mm-hmm. when it was just ASCII. Right. And as soon as emojis hit the scene and pictures and... ASCII porn. It ruined, mm-hmm. it ruined it because every single company implements it a little bit different. Yeah, they do. They all have their own trademarked emoji. Yeah. So if you're on a Samsung phone on Verizon... Texting with another Samsung phone on Verizon using the Samsung or Verizon app, you're going to be fine. It's going to work fine because you're using the same implementation. Mm -hmm. But if you're messaging with somebody on T-Mobile, you're going to have a different experience. That's true. And it's probably going to be okay. You know what perfectly sums that up? Poop emoji. (laughs) Poop emoji looks different. Yeah. Looks different. It does. Yeah. No, I was just saying it's it's shite. (laughs) (laughs) Oh man! But also the the Google um, poop emoji is superior because the little flies fly around the. Poop. Oh god, that's good. It's that's good, good detail. It's good, good stuff. Attention to detail. Yeah. Poop detail. Um, but I know we haven't actually talked about anything of substance. Um, but we're going to take a break and then jump right <laughs> into news. <laughs> oh wow! Atheist Nomads is probably brought to you by listeners just like you. You can find out how you can become a patron at patreon.com slash atheist nomads. That's P A T R E O N dot com slash atheist nomads. 
Representatives Jared Huffman and Jerry McNeary of California, as well as Jamie Raskin of <laughs> I'm Maryland. I'm sorry, was that guy's name? Was Jerry McNeary? Jerry McNeary. McNeary. Jerry McNeary. McNeary. <laughs> oh, okay. McNeary. McNeary. You say that like three times, and it is the Jerry McNeary, weirdest. Jerry McNeary. Jerry McNeary. McNeary. Yeah. McNeary. Okay, I'm good. As well as Jamie Raskin of Maryland and oh, Dan Raskin. Kildee of Michigan have launched the Congressional Free Thought Caucus. Mm. This has the goal of pushing, quote, public policy formed on the basis of reason, science, and moral values to promote secular character of our government by adhering to the strict constitutional principle of the separation of church and state and to fight against discrimination against atheists, agnostics, humanist seekers, religious and non-religious persons and giving a forum for members of Congress to discuss their moral frameworks, ethical values, and personal religious journeys. Wow, that's really good, actually. Yeah, that sounds off. I yeah, was waiting. I was waiting for the Bible thumping to like c- come across or something. <laughs> but no, that sounds great. Yeah, it's a caucus for non-believers uh-huh. and non-believe things. That's really good. I like it. Yeah, what this kind of shows so is at the point that you have reached a point where there are enough members of Congress who are a a comfortable with being who they are, right, and b care about. <laughs> voters like them and know they can get away with caring Mm -hmm. about voters like them is when you start getting parties playing to your particular group free thinkers have the potential of being a major voting block yes the non-religious are the third largest group on the planet yeah Uh yeah and uh, considering that the average age of that group is fairly young yeah definitely a lot to tap into and if you look at how now, it's it's interesting how they have fully been courted by a political party mm-hmm. one way or the other. Uh, non-believers, or at least the non-religiously affiliated, are larger, is a larger demographic than evangelicals, mm-hmm. Catholics, mm-hmm. Hispanics. It's a lot of people. Black people, LGBT community. Mm-hmm. Uh, Just a lot of people. Yeah. But- they're also largely defined by um, their apathy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it's really hard to get them to go out and vote along certain lines when... They don't really have any hot button uh, topics. Yeah, that it's you like, can, like I just happen around. to not be a believer. It's not really like my point in existing <laughs> to spread that right. word. So it's really hard to... But if you can... And I think really they're not going for the general... None. They're going for atheists, humanists, skeptics. Uh, we're still talking about five to eight percent of the population there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, who actively identify with one of those labels. Also, if you're going to be using a um, speaking medium, don't use the word none. Yes, I, I, none. I know. <laughs> none is in non-religious. <laughs> Um, <laughs> but to the... confuse me so much, <laughs> you've been going off on the nuns, and I'm like, "What is your pr- what?" But if you're looking at, at five, nuns are cool now. When five to eight percent of the population, that's still a voting block about half the size of of Latinos. That's a pretty big thing. That's big. Yeah. Uh, so it's half the size of Latinos, or more than the Latinos? About half the size of Latinos. Okay, yeah, it's not bad. Um, more than double the size of the Jewish community, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. well over double the size of the Jewish community. Right. Uh, and and so it's about time that we get and more reviled. (laughs) Yeah. But so it's, it's time that we get the attention and yes, these are all four of them are Democrats. It's my vote and I want it now. (laughs) It is no surprise that it's the Mm -hmm. Democrats that are the ones that are forming a congressional free thought caucus uh it would be hard to be republican and an atheist yeah we tried to we tried to do that with one interview and it just it that was debacle yeah it's very difficult it was hilarious it was so glad we did it but yeah that was it was i was having a really hard time not calling her a racist racist and fascist well that's actually no i did call her a racist you did yeah, I did call her The a problem <laughs> is you can't be a Republican and a humanist. You can be a Republican and an atheist just fine. But if... Yeah, I, I agree with that. Yeah. But it's yeah, very it's the difficult. humanism that is... The modern Republican Party is ideologies and dogma do not... Good to people. Yeah, go well with humanism. Now, the, the unfortunate thing is if you look at 
Trump's Trump's base, mm-hmm. evangelicals that like Pence, yeah, and neo Nazis that like Trump. A surprising and horrifying amount of those neo Nazis and the alt right are atheists. Oh, Proud Boys, yeah, and I suspect some of that was possible because both parties have been repeatedly shitting on us every single election cycle. I think it just reinforces the idea that the term atheism really doesn't mean anything. So you can't, it's not oh, yeah. a point of view. It's just the absence mm-hmm. of a particular point you of have view. To, you have to correct people into, into pigeonholing them into, uh, do you mean humanism? Do you mean... Well, the way to not shit on us is to leave God out of your platform and actually promote science. Yeah, which I mean, is that's what why this that caucus does wants well. to do. Yeah, it does both. They are pro-science and they look out for the rights of the non-believers and the skeptics and whatnot. I think it's important because it's a do- it's a foothold mm-hmm. into having a secular as like frame or point of view in the conversation so that laws can at least identify things because there is a caucus. Exactly, because the last 10 years has been insane actually no the last two years has been insane like- it's pretty rough like the uh swinging pendulum of politics shows the contrast and in that contrast you see a lot of things that are necessary mm-hmm. so it's interesting that this might not have happened if uh hillary had won the presidency because there wouldn't yeah. have been as much of a need for it but this is a good thing i mean it, it, it's like a lot of stuff that these these people do though i mean we'll see if it actually pans out or if it's just posturing Mm -hmm. although i don't know why it would just be posturing when we aren't much of a political entity as a group anyway yeah yeah that just throws me back to the good old days where we used to daydream about gore right i I, I think we'd be if gore had been voted i think what's what's gonna end up happening is if this does well in the midterm elections this year Mm -hmm. i think we'll see this group double or triple in size before 2020 uh yeah so what's something you can do to support them do they have like make sure they don't lose (laughs) okay yeah if they don't lose we win if these guys put their neck on the line and get defeated by would-be theocrats then we're fucked okay completely now i suspect that they are all very very confident and safe in their seats otherwise they wouldn't take this risk yeah i mean it's politics at the end of the day Uh uh-huh yeah it's true yeah, look at uh, Sinema, or whatever her name is, uh, out of Arizona. Mm-hmm. She's running for Senate now. Nice. But she made sure that she kept, even though she is not affiliated with any religious group, she made sure she has kept her identity as separate as possible from atheists. She's in frickin' Arizona. Right. I don't blame her for that. Yeah. And if she got into the Senate, that'd be frickin' awesome. Yeah, it would be really great. Yeah, non-religious... Uh, caucus i'm breathing today i'm really breathing well today <laughs> doing great guess who has the highest pollen count in the country right now we do yeah that's crazy yeah i went hiking earlier and uh that. maybe that's what it was i don't know we were up in the hills Aerole, you balsam root. oh you got up just high enough to inhale all of the pollen yeah so we're there yeah got it okay done. i'm in i'm ready all right so moving on to this is one where i have very complicated feelings about it yeah um The chaplain of the U.S. House of Representatives was given the choice of retiring or being fired by Paul Ryan. That's being fired. You just get to decide how Uh, it looks. Yeah. Well, it looks good on your resume. (laughs) He he chose to retire. He might as well retire. Right. No, I say go down, fight, and burn it down. So that's what I do. Flip a table. (laughs) Why would the Catholic House Speaker force out the Catholic priest serving as the chaplain? It was because Father, Father Patrick Conroy use the opening invocation to encourage the House to not forget about the poor while debating the tax reform bill a few months ago. And he has also allowed a Muslim to offer (gasps) the invocation. No. Yeah, this guy uh, guy came in with some controversy, and he's going out with controversy. Mm -hmm. I think Boehner was the one who put him in, right? Yeah. Yep. Also a Catholic. I mean, personally, I don't really see why we even have a chaplain for Congress or Senate. Or right. And that's where like, the, like, I don't know how to feel about this. Yeah. So, like, like I, whatever, I have a hard time being I, enraged because of the fact that he shouldn't be there in the first place. 
But if they're going to have one, you shouldn't be able to out them on for political reasons. Well, it's it's a political job. I mean, it's it's a, not it's, supposed to. It's be. supposed to be a bipartisan political job, a neutral political job. It's supposed to be a non political position, and, and it's it's not. so so the role of of a, a chaplain in one of an in a legislative body is to oversee the invocation process, mm-hmm. to visit with the members of the legislative body and their families and staff members. Yes. To provide counsel if they need it, comfort, support, whatever that they need. Can you do a psychologist and for that? That's about it. Yeah. Uh, but they are also, in the way it is set up, supposed to be the moral compass for that legislative body. That's gross. The person who is there yeah. to, when they are forgetting about the vulnerable, to pull them back. Catholics have always, or at least in recent centuries, have taken a very serious interest in the poor, um, often in allowing them to suffer, but usually some kind of, of aid and care for the, for the poor. Mm-hmm. And so it's not surprising that when a bill was being considered that was so going to be so damaging to the poor that he would say something from the House floor. Mm-hmm. Especially considering how much Congress brings up God. Right. The yeah, more, I love it. The more you bring God into the politics, the more you are opening up the door for the church to speak about your politics. Mm-hmm. They got what they wanted, and they don't like it. The separation of church and state mm-hmm. is supposed to be about protecting the church from the politics and politics from the church. It's to keep this from ever happening. It's to keep God from being used as grounds for legislation or for clergy members to be trying to sway votes. We're not very good at that part. We're not. No, we are terrible. at it. Yeah, it happens a lot. And so it bothers me that he spoke out on a political issue that was being considered. Mm hmm. But nowhere near as much as it bothers me that it had to be said. Isn't that, isn't that interesting? 435 members of Congress, many of them representing, especially on the Republican side, representing the poorest and most impoverished districts in the country. Yeah. And they had to be reminded to think about the poor and not just their wealthy donors. That's just funny to me that the chaplain would uh, even cons- think that, of course, they consider the poor. They're being inundated with reminders that there are poor people in their districts. They're purposefully ignoring that because that doesn't pay their bills. Well, remember, Paul Ryan's actual view of the universe is, and he's very open about this, he's very Ayn Rand. Mm-hmm. He believes in a world of producers and takers. So in his worldview, there's no really such thing as poor people. There's just people who take. And when you bring up the poor, that's what he filters that into. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's very offensive to him and his worldview for you to tell him that as a producer, he should care about the people who are only takers. Which makes him a terrible Catholic. (laughs) Terrible person. And a horrible person. Yeah. He sounds a lot more like a prosperity gospel evangelical. I think, I, I mean, it's really hard to tell that the way that the Christianity blends into their uh, politics is less important than this philosophical mm-hmm. stuff. And they're very oh, much yeah. like zero sum game people. They don't really feel like it's their responsibility to take care of the people in the bottom 10 or 20 percent. It's just not how they view the universe. So when you bring someone in, even if it's their job to tell him, hey, look, don't forget that we are also responsible for the poor people. He's going to be like, well, that's bros. Like, mm-hmm. why would you say that? You're fired. So, yeah, it's just it's just weird, but it all comes down to just how Paul Ryan processes the universe. And, and then he's out. Yeah, and then, and then he he's leaves. quitting anyway. Yeah. So, so, like, he just doesn't give a shit. So he fired him because he doesn't care. Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. that's what, nothing to lose. He probably would have fired him earlier if he could have. Mm-hmm. But that would have been political suicide, and now it doesn't matter, so off he goes. But, yeah, you got to get rid of him. It's so funny. You know, you could, you just went, they couldn't have gotten anybody worse than Boehner. <laughs> And then they get Paul Ryan. I am afraid of who they come up with next. Actually, literal Hitler. 
Banner, what, Banner wasn't actually terrible. We still treated he him was, like he was terrible. He was I impotent. Mean, <laughs> no, they're all been terrible. That was a little below the belt there. <laughs> He was orange. His job performance <laughs> was rather so impotent. Orange. Well, he couldn't do anything. Yeah. Like, it's... The Republican Party has been the way that it is since they digested the Tea Partiers that they created. Because mm-hmm. they did an upswelling and then absorbed that upswelling. And then the way the political process works is <laughs> these Tea Partiers... a condition. Right? <laughs> so, like, they created, using their propaganda wing and some political moves, essentially they set fire to the Tea Party in response to the cultural backlash of the pendulum swinging to the left again. And then they attempted to bring them into the political party. But what happened is these Tea Partiers went and got the political jobs thereby changing the actual DNA of the Republican Party. Mm-hmm. As a matter of fact, progressives could do this to the left. It's the process is very simple. You just take voting seats within the Republic or the Democratic Party. And then when you comes to making decisions, it would be like a reverse Tea Party. Yeah. The only problem is, is there's not a unifying element on the left that gets us active enough to join in. Our, our umbrella is a little too big for that. But yeah, because, let's all get excited about general liberalism. Yeah, and it's well, very if, difficult. If, if you it go is. back to when the Tea Party started, it was at the same time as Occupy Democrats was happening. True, that or was... Occupy Wall Street. And I met Occupy the Occupy Democrats. Wall Street people, and yeah. I wasn't impressed with them. And That's the, part of the problem. The Tea Party group had a goal. It was get angry, get people energized, and get voted into office. And the Occupy Wall Street group had a goal of camping out in the park. No, well, they had a goal. They had the same goals. They just didn't follow up with that whole getting people voted in. That was where it fell apart. They wanted to get people angry and energized, and they did, but then they didn't follow through with the voting in yeah. and getting candidates out on the playing field, so it fell apart. We lost a really good opportunity, but I understand why, especially in Idaho, why liberal people have a hard time stepping up and running against incumbent republicans it's just it's a waste of money it's very difficult and there's a a chance that you might might have gotten voted in but is it worth the risk of losing all that money and time and the tea partiers didn't actually try to run against any democrats no they were trying their goal was to primary out establishment republicans well this is the primary goal of the tea partiers the problem was is the old the the grand old party actually had a game plan. They were really good for decades of creating and grooming candidates that would become political leaders. Mm-hmm. And those people are still around, the Bainers and everything. And some of that, like Paul Ryan, what he is, is he's the hybrid the of both of these things. He has some very old school right wing values and he's heavily influenced by a lot of the uh philosophical thought of, of the new right. Mm-hmm. So he's just it's she's just gross. So on the left, <laughs> yeah. the problem that we have is the last time that we had an upswelling was with a charismatic leader. And then when we tried to replicate it, our two choices was a charismatic older fellow that automatically alienated some people or a traditional incrementalist leftist who automatically alienated people. Mm-hmm. So just with the cards at hand, even though they ran a populist on the right uh, once it became clear he was going to be the candidate, they've mostly been in lockstep. I mean, you can watch people, Mitch McConnell. I mean, they make certain political moves and just enough pull away. But until uh, the the uh, House of Cards falls down around Trump, I wouldn't expect them to really struggle. I, I would not suggest watching Mitch McConnell too closely because um, it will probably upset your stomach. I know he's really gross. <laughs> just all he's these really super frowny. He's, well, he's just not a happy person, but it's not a happy job. His Boehner's, life sucks. Boehner's issue was he couldn't get these two elements to co- cooperate. Right. That's why he yeah, quit. Right. It's not Boehner's fault. I mean, I didn't like the guy either, but you just can't make el- every element of a party happy when they're just diametrically opposed to each other. Yeah. So what we see now is a lot of the people are either waiting their turn or just waiting to see what happens. Uh, Mitt Romney has to face a primary challenger this season. Yeah, that was a and that's, bad I think, news bears for him. And I think it's how you take these guys down uh, one way or the other. Not that Mitt Romney is the good guy. I mean, there's no really... In, the, in those parties, it's not like there's a good person. There's it, just, with Romney, what's going to be interesting is he's running in Utah for yeah. Senate. How much do Mormons in Utah care about the fact that he's from Massachusetts? 
Uh, who knows? He's Mormon. That's that's all they care about. Yeah, I think their yeah. Mormonism supersedes their, you know, okay. their, their uh, geological nativism. I don't that's know. why he moved there. Yeah, Greater Ups Falling. He's, he's a representative of an older wing of the party that doesn't really have a lot of vessels running through anymore. There's not a lot of energy mm-hmm. in that part of the right. A lot of the energy has been running through anger and just being a counterinsurgency to what the left was doing. So now that the the rebels are in charge again, we're trying to replicate some of that on the left because there's just a general sense of disfattis- dissatisfaction rage with a lot of the activities with the Trump administration. But it's just difficult because it is a very oppressive thing to fight against these kinds of just an un- unassailing assaults on human rights from every angle possible. Yeah. All right. Well, speaking of whatever you very that. well worded about <laughs> human Thanks. rights, as part of an overdue but misguided revamping of a DOJ manual that guides federal prosecutors, they removed in its entirety a section titled Need for Free Press and Public Trial and also removed references to racial gerrymandering. And they did add in language about dealing with leaks. This is basically the field manual that helps inform. Uh, prosecutors, so they know how to translate and persecute the law. Prosecute the law is mm-hmm. the word. Persecute yeah. will work too. Prosecute the law, the law. So it's not the language of these articles are always very alarmist, but it's not like they were going to pay attention to those things anyway. What this does is this removes the part of the rule book that says they should. Yes. So it's not like it changes anything about what they're going to do. All it does is illuminate how they feel the law should be looked at, but we already knew that. So I'm a little bit less stressed out about this information because it only confirms what we already knew about them. They don't care about the rights of queer LGBTQA plus citizens. They don't care about the rights of most marginalized people. This is just them basically being like, what are you going to do about it? Mm-hmm. We're just going to take it out of the rule book. Now, this Deal. this rule book does actually have value. Yeah, they rewrite uh, it all the time. It, this is the biggest revision since... 1997 yeah so it it needed revising yeah and um, and updating this This is is just not the right way of doing it well i mean we're never going to agree with how these guys are gonna do Uh that they're just not going to be able to they don't look they don't have the same priorities this is what they mean by culture war at the end of the day is that what you prioritize is just looked at differently and how you do things is different and they weren't going to do anything Anyway, so adding these things, hmm, it's creepy that they're being this detail focused on changing things. But, you know, if the, if once the pendulum swings back the other way, stuff could be rewritten. And, of course, the right will make as big of a deal of it when we add those parts back in. Mm-hmm. They'll find a different way to frame it so it looks like the left is being bad. But that's what they'll do. Now, if you are concerned about liberty... If you're a right-leaning person who identifies kind of libertarian, this should be alarming because this is the right saying that they don't care about the free press. They don't care about public trial. They are okay with racial gerrymandering and they want to silence whistleblowers. Well, they don't think racial gerrymandering is a thing. (laughs) That's it goes back to just how they view the world. It's not when we try to frame it, we frame it so that we talk about it in a way of racial, because that's what we see when we look at the numbers, is they go out of the way to separate these things, cut demographics up so that nobody actually wins a district. It's just gerrymandering, how you do gerrymandering. Doing it racially just takes the knowledge that you have about how people vote and yeah. making sure they don't have any power. So. Being open about taking power away from marginalized groups is less scary, once again, than them actually doing it, which they were already doing. It's just now they're not obfuscating the fact as well. Mm -hmm. They're just being more open about it. And changing the rules means there's nothing you can point to that says, hey, you can't do that. And if you look at some of the court rulings, uh, Texas just had a court change its opinion on uh, because of, of the... I'm going to see if I can remember this one right. So the initial ruling was that they were, it was illegal uh, racial gerrymandering. Right. And then the appeals court agreed with that and sent back to the lower court 
do something about it. Mm-hmm. The lower court ordered that they change something. And what Texas did was they changed, and it wasn't even gerrymandering. It was a voter ID law mm-hmm. that was clearly racially motivated. And so they told the state, you can't enforce this law as it is. And so the state tweaked it. And the new rule that is being applied is terrifyingly, if the revision wasn't informed by racist intent, then it's all okay. Well, if it wasn't racist when they made the rule, then the fact that there's racial implications they find ethically permissible because it wasn't intended. This is another case of like, a lot on the left, What we well, one of the things that we talk about is impact over intent. But on the right, they want to keep their moral purity. So what they do is they like to flip that. And they go, mm-hmm. well, our intention wasn't initially racist. So any racial actions are just side effects that weren't intended and yeah. aren't a problem because it wasn't intended. So when you make a voter ID law, the argument, of course, being that, well, we need to prove that you are who you are before you vote. Which, when you, when you reduce it to that scale, is actually an arguable point. When we scale it back a bit, we find out that the actual percentages for people voter fraud is, are in, so small. They don't influence votes, except mm-hmm. on the smallest of levels. And they're so rare that it just doesn't really happen. Yeah. Entire- or when it does, it's really obvious. Yeah, people get caught, but... Like when more people vote in an election than there are people in Chicago... In a local Chicago election. Yeah, that's, that and that's happened. done and that's done more locally. That's not like mm-hmm. there's not a systemic problem with voter fraud across the system. Yeah. It's not voter fraud that causes issues. One of the dangers of uh Donald Trump lying about this fact, however, is simply the fact that he says that it's real. Like remember how he claimed that he would have won the popular vote if for except for all those fake votes that we the got three million fake votes. Yeah. And, and yeah. it turns out that you can just say that and it doesn't really come back to bite you on the ass because the people who want to believe you believe you so strongly mm-hmm. that those three million votes might as well exist in their reality. Yep. The facts that they believe they believe Donald Trump won the electoral vote and the uh, popular vote because they believe those three million uh, voting fraud things are real. So once we believe it's real, these votes actually make a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. If three million people can influence a national election to this degree, then there should be a rule. The fact is that it doesn't. And the fact is that there are some clear rules uh, about keeping people from voting. And it turns out that if you establish even what would seem like a low benchmark of having a photo ID, you actually preclude a vast majority, not majority, but a vast percentage of people who should be able to vote won't Mm -hmm. be able to actual citizens with voting rights can be turned away. Now in Idaho, uh, they can ask you for your ID and you can just be like buzz off dude. And then you just basically have to sign or affirm that you are who you say you are. Yep. So it's, it's basically a bullshit rule because it's like, give us your ID. No. Well, are you sure you're you? Yes. Okay. Go ahead and vote. Now the, what makes this new Texas one, more insidious Mm -hmm. is if you don't have id they don't just make you sign a form saying that you are who you say you are they kill you but there's only a limited number of acceptable reasons for why you don't have id yeah and And that's the sketchiest part because if you don't have id and it's not for one of the reasons on the form you can't vote yeah they're keeping people from voting with these rules with the intent, because they care about intent, of protecting the democracy, when in reality it doesn't protect anything. Yeah, It's very, very similar to the argument that they're using with the wall. They create false facts mm-hmm. on the influence and the percentage and the numbers in immigration, and then once everyone believes, or enough people believe those facts, it justifies the wall on its own, because we make these emotion, we make these decisions emotionally. So this is one of the reasons why... Uh, accuracy and news reporting is super important is because that's the foundation we make a lot of our decisions on voting fraud is not a problem this has been shown you Mm -hmm. don't even need to spend a lot of time researching it to confirm this for yourself it's just so been looked into because it is a political football yeah so i uh, it's just and it does have some real world effects because Voting can influence democracy still, especially if it's done to a specific degree. 
You know, I mean, they do gerrymandering is the fight of the uh, the institution to decide for itself how it evolves. Whereas, a, you know, everybody being able to vote means that we, the people, can influence the decision more. And right now, we've we they've managed to argue it to be almost fifty fifty. So, if enough people vote or can be convinced to vote, then we can win our argument. But mm-hmm. that's that's always hard. Yeah, and we're we're in the age where voter suppression or attempts to make voters irrelevant are ridiculously well calculated. It really is. And I'm going to be uh, be honest, enough people voted for Trump that I'm also starting to believe that democracy is ridiculous at its heart. <laughs> the fact is, there, there, it's hard to deny that. All right, let's go ahead and move on. The Tennessee Senate has now passed House Joint Resolution 37, which has which means it already passed the House. And this has the goal of adding a line to the state constitution that says, quote, that liberties do not come from government, but from almighty God. He has an argument that they make, and it's pointless. It's it's a uh, it's a it's an attempt to get voters out for twenty twenty when it's when this could happen. Mm-hmm. It's it's not like there could be any legal teeth to it because it doesn't. It's not saying anything. Nope. It's it's basically so that they can use it as an argument. Actually, it is saying something. It's saying that liberties don't come from the Constitution or from the courts; they come from God. Which means your right to discriminate against gay people because they're icky, you can ignore the courts. Well, that's, that's what they're that's, that's what they're trying what, to say. That's how we frame it. That's not what they're trying to say. What they're trying to say is is that the sense they know their religion is correct, they know their rights came from God. It's it, but politically, what they're saying is, hey, Christians, this is an important time. Mm-hmm. Like it's it literally is just raising the banner so that people pay attention. It's the same reason why they. They know what their hot buttons are, and so they push them. So trying to make it a religious us v them thing means that they could probably fire up a few more uh, old people, a few more evangelicals will come out, and hopefully that's enough to give them an edge. Not much, yeah. But this kind of thing, a one or two or three percent even could be beneficial oh, yeah. down the line, just because more people are voting, and if more of your team shows up, then more of your laws and ideals and stuff will pass. No, I I think it's part of it is they they want their base to think this matters. They know it doesn't matter. They might. I. It's difficult to tell. Like these, when you listen to these (laughs) of these evangelicals talk, they are true believers. Mm -hmm. You know, they're like snake handlers. They really do believe, but that this is how it is. If they can convince their base that they're doing something to protect the the religious from this this evil godless onslaught. Uh, then they hope they can hold off the blue wave a little bit and shore up your defenses. And then if they can get on the ballot in 2020, they can try and keep the governor's seat and uh, keep Tennessee from going blue. Yeah. I mean, it's I it, that's definitely a way that I think a lot of them look at it. It's just very cynical and political. But I also think, you know, what the very underlying thing is, The more it's like the fact that there is a local government made a decision to make part of public property, private property. So that Boise could be a cross over Mm -hmm. Boise. It used to be public property. Yep. Well, it used to be uh, used to belong to one of the the tribes that lived here, actually. Yeah. (laughs) And then we took it and then we named it something else. So I think it's like that. It's like the crossover Boise. If once you plant your flag on the Constitution, it 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 does. It, there's a lot of subtle things. The mm-hmm. fact that there's a Christian crossover Boise fundamentally paints us as a Christian town, yeah. no matter what. So I think once you have uh, the God in the Constitution, it makes it easier to add more God into the Constitution. It makes it easier to point that God is a founding part of your the, the way your government runs. And as pointless as the argument of saying that things come from God, it does mean that they can start to try to make the argument that once it's in the Constitution, well, this is what God actually meant. Then you can bring the religious mm-hmm. side into it and you could do it. But that's a very far that's very far down the line. Oh, yeah. And even then they don't expect to have it easy because legally it's very difficult to try to determine a OK, so exactly which version of God are we talking about? Mm-hmm. And B Listen, professional religious people have been arguing over the exact meaning of the Bible 
since men put it together. It's not like the the courts getting involved is going to hash it all out. But the angle they're going with it, liberty is coming from God. Mm -hmm. It's all about protecting religious freedom. Yes. Yeah, Over and that's everything and, else. And that's definitely a, a whistle for them, a dog whistle for them. The religious freedom is basically how Christians say that this is a Christian issue because they're not the way that they look at it is any attempt to hedge in what they want to do with their religion is a religious freedom issue because mm -hmm. they see freedom as the ability to do what their religion wants them to do. The opposite side of that obviously is you have freedom to do what you want. You just can't do everything you want to. So you have freedom to speech. You just can't yell fire in a theater. And these guys want to do the equivalent of that with morality where they just want to be like, well, we think and mind you, I mean, even within religious circles, they don't agree on everything. But it's there are what almost 90 percent Christian in that state. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So Something like that. so the vast the Venn diagram of what all those people believe in will still be a success for them, even if it's rather benign on a grand scale. And the activists who do this, the right-wing activists, will push further. And that's where we worry about the anti-gay legislation, because that's what they actually do. Historically, once they have these kinds of majorities where they can push things through, is they always try to go after what we considered marginalized people, but they considered problematic people. Yeah. They, they just don't want... They Well, for instance, they took... Uh, they're taking LGBT question off the uh, the... Uh, Mm, census is the thing yeah. that they're, they're doing and this they're is tweaking the, the the questions quite a bit yeah, yeah so what this does this erodes a lot of our ability to study and influence the effect of people if we don't know if a couple is same sex or or how it's look like how laws and rules and everything influence these people because we just don't have the information i personally think that information exists if you're gonna mine information at least use it for the public good mm -hmm. like it's not a corporate thing it's like the census is the only chance that we get to take a snapshot of where our people are at and the questions we ask they're using their advantages politically to erode our ability to do things for people in the future so the worry about adding god to the constitution being a gay issue is simply because we know historically that's what they end up going towards even though it's not phrased in an anti-gay way, which mm -hmm. is a defense. Once again, impact over intent. We're worried about what's going to happen. They're worried about the purity of what they're saying. Yeah. Now, I know we've already talked about, not too long ago, at least something similar to this, but Oklahoma's Adoption Protection Act has now passed both houses of the state legislature, and this bill will allow adoption and foster care agencies to reviews parents, refuse parents whose lives violate the agency's, quote, sincerely held religious beliefs which on paper sounds nice it means you don't have to give babies to people who you think are gross uh -huh. the only problem is you're the one who gets to decide those things uh -huh. this is the downside to allowing religious groups to predominantly uh take over things like adoption agencies is once they have the system in place there's no need for anything else and then they start to make the argument of like well you can't force us to go against our religious beliefs Mm -hmm. And that's where they, they, they manipulate the chessboard in a way that the only move we have is to say you can't discriminate. And they go, well, you can't tell us what to do. And so that's where we're at with this, is they're moving forward the chess move of, well, you can't tell us what to do. And if that passes, what happens is there's not much of an avenue in these states that do these kinds of things for same-sex couples or non-traditional family units to adopt children. I mean, if you really want to, you know, do the whole nose of the camel thing, it, you could you could eventually not want to give uh, children to Muslims mm -hmm. simply because it's morally representative, rep, uh, reprehensible to you to uh, put a child in those environments. Now, I think what we're seeing here is actually what you're describing is what they're wanting to create. Yeah, it's a lot of these agencies started as orphanages run by a church back in the old days and have since evolved into church run or affiliated agencies. And since they were already existing, the state started just giving them money. Well, they're the process. It's the same reason that like judges can send you to AA, mm -hmm. despite the fact that it's a religious organization in its heart and it's not even funded by the state. 
because that's the but only exists. place. Yeah. And there's no real reason to create a secular version of something that already exists. Mm-hmm. So the fight that we're on is literally on their hill trying to tell them what to do with their adoption agencies. The solution is simply to create a secular thing. I think this is our solution we had last time. Yeah. Create a secular version and then just cut them off. Like, I mean, just cut them off from federal funding. They can still help. Mm -hmm. There are in this state, there are almost 10,000 children under the state's control. It was 9,500 according to one uh, statistic I looked up today and did not verify. So there are thousands of children in the state and there are willing families that are safe and can foster these children to become a good person and a good citizen. But if we allow the churches to decide who's good, then we lose of percentages Mm -hmm. of families. So what we're seeing is the gap of people who the churches might not find acceptable that would be acceptable to society because we have different standards. Yep. And yeah, the only solution is the separation of church and state. It's difficult in these cases because Uh you don't have the (laughs) money. It's expensive and building new infrastructure is very difficult. It it, it is difficult. I'm definitely not. I'm not. And that's the other problem is because a lot of these organizations are religious. The people who have the most experience are themselves already involved in these religious. Mm -hmm. It's just kind of a mess. Yeah. It's just one of those things where there's more. There's enough families that want children that you think that we could at least help these family units come together. But where the rubber meets the road, it gets so sticky. Yeah. Yeah, it does. And Hawaii has become the 12th state to ban gay conversion therapy for minors. Well, that's good. It's gross that that's not a federal law. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Oh, the practice of medicine, which is what this would kind of fall under, Mm -hmm. is regulated by the state. Right. And it's going to require all 50 states to get there. Now, yeah. what I find interesting is this, this article we have in the show notes. It's from hawaiinewsnow.com. Mm-hmm. It is incredibly short. One line talks about gay rights advocates talking about the practices being discredited by healthcare professionals, doing more harm than good. Right. And the one line in opposition to it And I'm going to read this. The bill was opposed by religious groups who consider sexual orientation a choice. Yeah, it goes back to just how they view. When you believe that people are choosing their orientation, it removes them from a group to being an actual group because Mm -hmm. they become a volunteer. But when you look at this article, the attention to why this was a bad thing and needed to change and the bill was a good thing. Got four out of the five paragraphs, not even paragraphs, four out of five lines in this article. Yeah, there's a lot of the article. The Christians got one. Well, fuck them. <laughs> I mean, and you look at the weight of the statements. You have discredited by professionals and does more harm than good to those who are subjected to it versus consider it a choice. <laughs> Yeah, the the problem is is the religious right can't they 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 can't manufacture more arguments. This is one of those things uh-huh. where I simply I I find that the more information people have about these conversion therapies and the tactics they use, the more natural revulsion that you'll have against them because it's not it's not something simple and and what I would even consider unnecessarily aggressive, which is sitting next sitting with the child and discussing things. Because the motivation, the agenda of the person doing it is to change and conform this person to a predetermined mold instead of allowing them to experience reality the way that they consider healthiest and safest for themselves. We don't, we're not big on children's rights in this country. Mm -hmm. We still believe that you own another person till they're a predetermined age. There's not a lot of nuance in it. Uh, Idaho is one of the worst states for that. I mean, we basically give children the right to die. If their parents yeah. determined that they should die for a religious reason. So it's difficult. And that's how far Idaho has to go. Other states, which are a little more progressive. I mean, considering how progressive Hawaii is, I mean, they've they've had state funded health care for ages. And they're just now getting to the point where they're willing to admit that maybe electroshock therapy and what is essentially psychological torture might not be good uh-huh. for a teenager's developing. Yeah. Yeah. And also, it's pointless because it literally is a final gasp 
of trying to change someone. You don't send your kid off to these camps because they're flirting with a girl at school. You know, you do it because you're at the end of your rope and you've already tried other things or you don't think anything else will work. You don't just send your kid off to an expensive camp. That's rich people shit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but they have determined, uh, and, and part of this is unfortunately, uh, this is part of the thing that makes me still an activist in the atheist community is that the fundamental problem here is religion. Because we can't have a conversation about uh, presentation and sexuality and gender and all the nuances and the way that we're discovering people interact with reality because these people are very rigid in saying that being not straight or what they would just be like normal people is how they would phrase it. Mm -hmm. So it is going to be difficult. So it's. Gross that we're still having to tell people not to torture children. <laughs> so that's good. But gay, congratulations, Hawaii, on agreeing that torturing children is wrong. Good for you guys. Yes. And now it is time for another. We love hearing from our listeners. You can email us at contact at atheistnomads.com. Tweet us at atheistnomads. Send us a message on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash atheistnomads. Or better yet, call us and leave us a message at 541-203-0666. We might even play it on the show. You can also help us out by leaving us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or your podcast directory of choice. We got feedback from Caleb. <laughs> yeah, you did. Really enjoyed today's episode. This is about last week's episode. I am presently working with a gay woman who talks shit about gay men being nasty. She claims to have been infected by the polio vaccine and cured herself. Also claims to have had MS caused by bacteria. Yeah. Also self-cured. <laughs> numerological anti-vax pro-gun anti-gmo psych major she gets all the crazy from all sides and still claims to be a fan of science well you could still be a fan idaho man idaho <laughs> idaho just shake your head man that's so funny uh, yeah i mean you could say whatever you want like the emperor science i believe whatever okay so if she is in Idaho, she probably hasn't traveled much. Well, I mean... The odds of... Unless she is over what? The anti-vax 50, movement. 50, 60, the odds of her being exposed to polio is near zero. These... The, one of the things that happens sometimes is people convince themselves they have a disease that they don't have. Uh-huh. And then after, after they find out for sure they don't have it, instead of admitting they were full of crap, they're like, well, I was cured. I did it myself through going you know numerology uh, non-gmo by sticking some stone up my vagina right and it's the correlation causation issue they're not critical thinkers they don't realize that just because things happen parallel to each other that doesn't necessarily mean that those two things are interacting on any level now it might be or they could have an influence but going back to the stone argument which is one of the easiest to refute without there's just no evidence that holding a stone around you or near you or focusing on it or channeling energy means <laughs> any words. It doesn't mean anything. But if you carry stones with you and you maintain health, that you could ascertain that mm-hmm. that's why. And it would be convincing because that's the way that you're looking at the universe. Unfortunately, it feels like this poor person is easily influenced. Very easily yes. influenced by um, Facebook. Uh, Fake Goop. mom groups and it's super convincing um, to be quackery. It, it's convincing. It really is. And and yeah. the willingness to conform to the group mind think is in eight within primates. It's very difficult to work against for a lot of people. Mysteries and myths with Megan Fox. Mm-hmm. A new show coming to the Travel Channel. Who'd she sleep with to get that show? Mm. As a spokesman for mm. the show has put it. Fox has been obsessed since an early age with the history of ancient cultures, people, and places, always questioning their documented story. Now she's embarking on an epic and personal journey across the globe where archaeologists and experts will re-examine history, asking tough questions and challenging the conventional wisdom that has existed for centuries. The series will delve into some of the greatest mysteries of time, including whether Amazon women really existed <laughs> or if the Trojan <laughs> War was real. Oh my gosh. I, I love this. That's I love so this. sensationalist. So, well, I mean, trash television exists, but what we what we really have here is literally the argument was like, well, let's find out if what these books say is true or this random lady who used to be a celebrity. Well, okay, let's hear what she actually has to say about it. 
History only gives us a one-sided view of the truth. I haven't spent my entire life it's building false. a career in academia, so I don't have to worry about my reputation or being rebuked by my colleagues. What allows me to push back on the status quo, or which allows me to push back on the status quo. So much of our history needs to be re-examined. Well, it is. That's called archaeology. They're doing it every day. Uh-huh. And like, yeah, literally, and, and we I, have our best people on it. I agree. Yeah. I mean... <laughs> literally, how, I mean, the best people. Just the definition of whitewash. Um, whitewashing history needs to be you know, uh-huh. re-looked re- at. But what they're going for is just... I don't know. It's It sounds like just a fun, well, brain-dead... What's funny 30 is 30 minutes. She doesn't realize what she's saying is history needs to be reexamined. Look at that part. Yeah. Some yeah, of that needs is. to happen constantly. But because she isn't qualified, she's qualified to do it. Yep. Yeah. I haven't, I haven't, well, she's, but she's not in, what she's not articulate enough or wasn't articulate enough to stay in this instance was that her perspective as an outsider merely reinforces her ability to approach these things and not from the status quo position. It, it speaks to ignorance and how the process works. Mm-hmm. Like most sciences constantly reevaluated with an open eye, like a uh, science historian is a thing that actually exists. We already know the problems within the different branches of science and we are trying to change them. It's in science as it takes a while. Usually sometimes careers have to change and people need to move in places mm-hmm. But we are at a place with archaeology now where we're actually getting a lot better at trying to determine how things actually happened. Now, granted, always going to be questions and it's always going to be, but there's no outsider position allowed at a table where everyone is equally informed and have access to the information. If everyone at the table goes, okay, we've all been studying this for 20 years and this person for 50 and we have all this information that's been aggregated over lifetimes Mm -hmm. on, on this subject. You can't come in as an outsider and have an opinion with any value because you just don't have any of the underlying information. Yeah. I took two classes on archaeology in college mm-hmm. and spent six weeks actually on an archaeological dig. It sounds fascinating. I was even field s- or square supervisor by the end. What does that mean? Don't ask. You'll get in- way too into it. It's about a squares, though. A, a square that we were digging meter? out. I was in charge of that square and had to draw it out. Nice. And I had no idea what the fuck I was doing. Yeah. (laughs) Because I had only taken two classes and done one dig. By the time you're even remotely capable of speaking to what's going on, you've been doing it for decades. You guys are you guys are looking into this way too far. This was somebody who's like who wants to surface sensationalist myths. And go and have some hot girl investigate them. It has <laughs> nothing to do with the science of archaeology. No. It has nothing to do with um, actual, like, historians studying history. It, it is just, it's, well, it's the modern day History Channel stuff. So well, what you're saying is the show alien. wasn't her idea. Yeah, the she, show was done by puppet. the producers, yes. and then she was hired because when they talk to her about it for three minutes, they go, oh, you're going to be perfect. All right, yeah, just go do you. You just yep. do, you, you just have your do opinion. You, and we're going to discuss gonna make Amazonian some money. princesses. Sure, we're, we're going to set the agenda for the show. I would not be surprised if they're going to stu- quote unquote study the island of Lesbos. <laughs> it's um, sensationalist, you're right. Well, Amazon, yeah. Amazon is pretty close. It's, I mean, it's up yeah. there. It's, it's uh, yeah. Everybody's yeah. heard of it. Nobody knows anything about it. The problem with it, though, is that it's still subversive to facts. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. The, the underlying problem is I don't normally mind like the ridiculous ancient. The only problem I have is it's fundamentally ra- it's fundamentally <laughs> racist to think that the people who lived on this side of the planet didn't understand architecture and astronomy when they clearly did. Yeah. We, and to say that it couldn't have been them. Clearly, people in the past couldn't have done this. And, and it's like, well, it's here, right? Mm-hmm. Like, you don't just walk onto a playground and be like, well, the children didn't build this. Well, yeah, no, dummy. Like, now, I granted, that is literally the argument of the clockmaker. But in, in the case of where people actually live there, we're not looking for an invisible clockmaker. Those people lived there. And we know they did because well, they have buildings. Oh, for a, a, a great example. Ancient Egypt. It is easy to look at it as how could anybody that primitive 
have built those massive structures. Well, that's why we don't use the word primitive anymore. Well, the answer, it doesn't have meaning. It, it, it's not. It's not a progression. But the answer was actually pretty simple. Ninety nine point nine percent of the population were slaves who did nothing but build monuments nine months out of the year. Well, yeah, they had a mono. Well, well, they had a. Uh, they had a very narrow they growing had a God season. God King that makes it yeah. pretty convenient. A narrow growing season that produced an abundant amount of food. Which meant they had nine months where you don't want the peasants to get restless. So what do you do? You have them move giant rocks to build you a big ass tomb. I think if you have a populace that isn't being actively engaged, there will at some point be somebody who is going to be manipulative enough to find. And when you look at historically how these were done, these these God kings were given Mm -hmm. egos just by being born into their family and were told that they were gods. And then once people start building temples to the afterlife, it becomes a competition, you know, and in some of the longest lived buildings on the planet were made because of men's egos. Yeah. It's yeah. really weird how that kind of worked out for them. Yeah. Petra, similar in that you had everything that's there is tombs, tombs carved out of the cliff by slaves. slaves, by slaves, ridiculously rich people wanted fancy tombs and owned enough slaves to be able to force them to do it. Yeah, the value of the individual is often lost in uh, history. Yeah. <laughs> and the only individuals that we do pay attention to are the ones that are rich enough to put their names down. There <laughs> is. A, it's really funny, though, that I was watching a documentary on uh, Rome. And one of the things that tells us about how rich Rome was for a while is there was a baker who was able to build a sepulchre for him and his wife that still exists today. Wow. In Italy. And he was a baker. Like he made enough money making bread to have his tomb live forever. And he, and it still exists. Him and his wife, it's still in Italy. It's an historical site. And this guy was a baker. And it, that was one of the reasons we know how loaded they were yeah. is quote unquote normal people could b- have these edifices constructed for themselves. Yeah. Which is the temporary, obviously, other than, you know, the in gigantic Next one is going to be Trump's wall. Well, I mean, at this point, when you, I don't know if you remember that old documentary Life After People. Which uh, it, it built upon the premise of what would happen if everybody just disappeared, mm. like raptured. And what it was, however, was an interesting study into what would happen if humans didn't influence the world around us. Yeah. So when you actually watch the DC episode, which is in the first season, it turns out one of the last living things in all of Washington, D.C. will be the aluminum uh, top they put on the Washington Monument to stop lightning. Yeah. And that'll be one of the last <laughs> living things. But the, the buildings that they built way back they at the founding crumble. part, they will be around literally hundreds of years after all the modern buildings are gone because of the what they're made out of. And as the swamp reclaims everything and, yeah, the monuments will mostly fall down, but the monuments themselves will still be recognizable as being manufactured for thousands of years when uh, all of our buildings will be wasted away. Wow. The, the aluminum will be around forever. But <laughs> the, the, the square I was I was working in. Doing archaeology, twenty five hundred year old house. Mm, wow, there were walls still intact. It's crazy how long stuffs can last. Yeah, well, not in a swamp. Nothing lasts in a swamp <laughs> except aluminum. Obviously, deserts are really good for that. Yeah, deserts are great. Yeah, swamps not so good. Well, even walking around the high desert in here, <laughs> like Monty Python. <laughs> you know, even walk around the high desert here, which still has some moisture. There are. Parts of the landscape haven't changed since my childhood over 30 years mm-hmm. ago. You know, you're just walking through and it's like, I remember this exact trail being exactly like this because it's the desert and almost nothing changes. There's abandoned barns that were probably abandoned around World War II that are still standing. Yeah. Crumbling, but still standing. Yeah. And like that's wood. with wood. I always like it when there's a new fire that uncovers part of the Oregon Trail. Yeah, that's always still <laughs> pristine. After... Thursday night showing of Infinity Wars. Yeah. Or Infinity War, sorry. Yeah, it's fine. Avengers, technically. A man <laughs> jumped from his seat, started waving his arms and shouting about the need for people to repent for their sins. It used to just be annoying and now it's terrifying. That is that is terrifying. People fled from the theater. A woman fell from the balcony. Like jumped 20 feet, from right? the balcony. Yeah. The police received calls that there had been dozens of gunshots. Panic is a weird beast. Which is why there are laws against that. Yeah, which is why Uh you're not allowed to yell fire. 
But I mean, Marilyn, you can't yell Jesus in a theater anymore either. That would be that'd hell be a good no. I, the first thing that would have popped through my head would have been this guy's about to kill everyone or himself. Yeah, yeah I just the, you don't just jump into a religious fervor at the end of a freaking movie. Though this guy does. Turns out, <laughs> not the first uh-huh. time he's done that. I would I, he just does that. Stuff. I would tie him up, put him on the on a boxcar out of town, <laughs> and just ship him out. So instead, the police arrested him. And have charged him with words that make her disturbing the peace or something. It's something very along the lines specific, of disturbing the peace. Yeah, it's a very specific rule about verbiage or like language meant to incite riots or something. Oh, something I, very I, ridiculous. Suspicion of offensive language likely to cause a violent reaction. Yeah, yeah, and that's to me that doesn't seem like we're on a lot of great ground. I just don't think there's a lot of rules in place because of how we like to worship the concept of religious freedom, where. Now that being super religious outwardly is now considered to be a scary trait because of what a lot of those people do. Yeah. Uh, and unfortunately, now, I would yeah. also add to it when you look at the list of the biggest mass shootings, San Bernardino and Aurora are on the list. Aurora was a movie theater. Yep. This movie theater where this guy was doing it was in San Bernardino. So you go to a place where there was not too long ago. A major mass shooting. Yeah, they're just more cognizant into of a the venue threat. where there had been another one, and start shouting about God and needing to repent and getting you know, pre- telling people to prepare for their death. Well, then they've always talked like that. In 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 his defense, well, that's a weird thing to say. <laughs> yeah, in his defense, the problem isn't that he because people have always been like this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, what's changed is everything else around it yeah and how a lot of people like that aren't like him apparently he's quote-unquote harmless we've just created an environment where people are legitimately terrified of the very small chance of dying in a terrorism attack it's so small you guys Mm -hmm. it's so small but in the moment the gambler's fallacy takes over and it raises to a hundred percent chance that the guy yelling about jesus is about to shoot people and yeah. then once everyone else is screaming, you would justify that just that would just be a good survival mechanism. And the injuries and everything are just well, a it had unfortunate to have been side the effect. way he did it, too, because somebody could stand up and and start preaching and not make people fear for their lives. This guy did jumping it in such and a waving way his arms and shouting. That and it was like, OK, he honestly believed that these people's souls were on the line and he needed to save them right now. Well, yeah, he's a, exiting the movie he theater. They could it. all. The thing is, is looking through their the lens so of sad. how they view the universe, that's what they should be doing. Yeah. He actually yeah. believes all those people are going to die in hell. And this is the only defense that can come up for them is that they're actually the only people behaving as they should behave <laughs> because they actually believe yeah. everyone else is on their way to hell. And now the fact that the world around him is more violent than perhaps this person is doesn't excuse the behavior but at least he's true to his cause <laughs> now he, he was also taking a big chance by going into the theater because you know his guardian angel is waiting outside along with everybody else's guardian angels are they not so, allowed in the theaters anymore you have to invite yeah. them in i hear no no they're, they're vampires not, they're not allowed in the theaters <laughs> nope no, they, 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 you leave your guardian angel behind you when you go into the theater how would you know that where did you hear this that is what out of your ass no that's what Adventists widely believe. Oh, up yeah, nobody until cares the what 80s. Adventists that believe. That's so sad. It's, that is that yeah. is some piercing until the eighties. Some <laughs> piercing the darkness bullshit right there. <laughs> Jesus, uh, there's some Pentecostals that believe the same thing. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, yeah. they think their souls that... are captured on film too, right? <laughs> some of those people. I, it's just manipulation tricks. You can't like. I, I just like how they believe that God has. In, like a perfect amount of knowledge and power and yet you have to do specific things for the angels to defend you like you couldn't just be like no no don't worry about it god is protecting you with his magic aura mm-hmm. like we have those in dungeons and dragons i'm pretty sure god could make the real thing happen it's a protection from evil yeah, it's it with you all the he, time just depends if he can make the roll or not i <laughs> <laughs> gotta roll the dice I, it's, what's his charisma yeah. score <laughs> those people the people who do this kind of thing are not the kind of people to have casual conversations about religion though Mm-mm. this is definitely a uh a firebrand someone who really thinks they're helping which is weird i bet they were surprised at the reaction because once the panic starts it's not like you can stop it you can't yell mm-hmm. i mean the only thing you could do is be quiet but in that environment it going quiet all of a sudden would almost be more scary and because you couldn't confirm what the noises were. The area we have the greatest legal precedent for restricting speech is theaters. Because people die when there's a panic in a theater. 
In this case, we're nobody really did. Lucky. We're really lucky nobody got trampled. Well, yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't blame someone from throwing themselves off a 20 foot. If okay, I do. That was stupid. Gun. Not if there's someone next to you with a gun. Like, it's through the perspective of everybody's actions. Was he up on the balcony? Or yeah, was he, he, was, he was up above. Oh, he, he was? I oh. believe so. I mean, I could be wrong on that. First yeah. thing you do is you fall down and you play dead. But there's no Everybody way that she jumped that. towards the danger. Well, like that's not what she did. <laughs> She's getting away from I something. She fell. No, it said jumped. Yeah, she she jumped. So I'm assuming there was something up there. Like it's not like you're jumping down no, towards fall the gun. Down and play dead. Yeah, push like or it's fall just like or gri- tripped. It's just like a. Yeah. Grizzly bear. But she's like, fuck this, I'm out. <laughs> that means she <laughs> thought there was leg, a dude. She don't care. She armor crawl out. I mean, it's 20 feet. You, She survived it. I mean, that's way better than getting shot in the moment. I mean, also, most people aren't aware of how often you can get shot and not die. They, they've they watched movies and think a bullet's going to end you if it hits you in the shoulder. Yeah, that's true. I mean, yeah, like there's only a few places. Human bodies are amazingly resilient. We evolved to survive on the savanna, and it didn't get nicer when we left. Like, it just... Our bodies are unbelievably tough. You can live without a lot of your organs. You can have bullet. Yeah, one bullet could kill you. But you almost like it doesn't happen as often as people think it does. Most shots are pretty just horrible, but not life threatening. Okay, so all it says about her getting out was <laughs> We're that she left story. over the railing of the upper seats of the auditorium. Yeah, and I'm just using a pure eye logic. So, she's escaping. You're not going to yeah. be like, holy shit, he's down there. I better jump. <laughs> Yeah, it's not. I'm assuming uh, it's still, but it's a panicky situation. And part of the problem is, uh, I'm assuming that the lights had either just come on or it was just dark. We're in that transitionary period. It's kind of awkward anyway. Somebody starts yelling. uh, Then all it really takes is one person to start rushing for that, like, floodgate to open. And then you would just run out with everybody else. Yeah. Oh, and she was... Okay, actually, I was reading the wrong line. Yeah. Um, she jumped over the railing to the ground 20 feet below and then was trampled by people. Well, yeah, she was hurt after jumping 20 feet off of the thing. That's like, going to hurt. Yeah, because she yeah. was on the ground. And then panic people will trample humans. We know that. And then she was taken to Lomelini University Medical Center, where fortunately it wasn't the 1980s, because that's Adventist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the U.S., Canada, and the European Union, in a coordinated effort, have been taking down ISIS-linked servers. Yes. And potentially greatly silencing the organization. They're, uh, well, they've lost a lot of ground on the ground ground. Yeah. And so what we're doing now is effectively that in uh, the internet is we're taking off a lot of the things they know and what they can do. They're just trying to limit the propaganda wing mm-hmm. and their ability to influence people. Because as we all know now, especially that online community is not what people think it is a lot of the times when it comes to this stuff. And uh, silencing ISIS is something that we as a human populace tend to agree on because they've already shown themselves to be pretty horrible for the most part. So they had initially started by taking down a mobile application and web infrastructure in August 2016. And the group responded by building a more complex and secure infrastructure. Yeah, like you do. So took a coordinated effort in many countries to take down the network and that's kind of crazy <laughs> yeah it is actually pretty nuts isn't it yeah at the point where cybersecurity is literally breaking down doors and walking out with physical equipment that's so nuts i mean <laughs> granted uh this information is really hard to get outside of because we're only getting this information directly from the people who are doing it yeah. and i doubt that isis is going to be completely honest about the dismantling of any of their servers so it, this would be one of those things that could easily fall into propaganda from the state. I personally believe that this is being mostly factually reported on simply because they have been losing ground and resources. They are not the Islamic State or ISIS, or ISIL, as Obama used to call them. They're not. They just they don't really have the resources for uh, without the resources they were trying to gain to do this in a long fight. Mm -hmm. It is at this point, it's a matter of attrition. The rest of the world is against them and they just aren't going to be able to establish themselves as a, as a kingdom long enough to be recognized by foreign powers. Yeah. Their, their biggest goal at this point would be because yeah, they've, they don't have a state. That's why they called themselves. The Islamic state is they wanted to establish one and that didn't really work. out. And since they lost all the land they gained, What's left is radicalize more people to commit more acts of terrorism. Well, it's because they don't really have any other options. Terrorism is an act of war when you don't have the resources to perform one higher up on the scale. Mm-hmm. We vilify terrorism, even though that's how a lot of wars were won. Vietnam, 
our own revolutionary war started off as a rebel insurgency. Uh, the, the idea is there's enough ground swelling that it becomes too painful for the powers to fight you. Mm-hmm. And then they just grant you independence. There wasn't a point in the modern world now with these guys and their point of view where they were able to do that. All right. Anyway, final story, Norway's progress party, which like many countries is, doesn't actually mean what it sounds They're like. They're nationalists. They are nationalists. They are anti immigration and Muslim part of the two party ruling coalition. And they are about to have their national meeting where they are going to vote on whether or not to propose a ban on the Muslim call to prayer. Yeah. It's just racism. Xenophobia. Now the Muslim call to prayer. I I have experienced it. Yeah. In Amman, Jordan suffering from atrocious sleep deprivation, hearing it, from numerous different mosques spanning 45 minutes while some of them are almost together while playing the same exact recording. I know, it's not funny. And just slightly out of phase. And, oh, it was terrible. It was... The reasons for banning it are not benign, however. And that's the no. problem. It's This is the opposite. The problem is their intent is wrong. Mm-hmm. I, I, Europe has been struggling with a lot of this too. Like the French want to, re, uh, to enforce the secular culture. And there is a, a line between trying to ensure uh, religions don't take over and just outright xenophobia. Right. And now I would say if they also don't allow businesses to have loudspeakers. Well, they, I mean, you're being, you're being fair now. And if they don't allow churches to ring their bells and they just don't allow outside noise like that, that is probably okay but they are specifically targeting the muslim call to prayer which means this is not okay by being specific they are being racist all right well we are out of time (laughs) mikey hi thank you so much for joining us yeah it's good to be back and you have the uh atheist comedy experience coming up on the 18th of may at the visual arts collective in downtown boise idaho in garden city uh tickets are only 15 dollars not so bad. yeah, that's about the going right for a good comedy show now, you guys. I've been uh I've been definitely keeping the, the price low for a long time, so <sighs> gotta raise it up a little bit. But it is a great venue, very progressive venue. Uh the uh owner of the place is a huge fan of the show, so we're gonna have a really great time. Uh I've got Lady Business, which you guys have had on the show, right? Mm-hmm. Jen Adams, who you should have on your show. She is so fantastic. Uh my classic friend uh Chadwick Heft. And uh, Sherry Jaffet, who uh, is a pretty, po- she's an old friend of mine. She's a pretty popular comic around these parts, and a lot of people don't know she's an atheist because she doesn't talk about it a lot. But it is part of her act. Uh, she does bring it up occasionally, and uh, it should be a lot of fun. So you can buy those tickets at Eventbrite. Um, Boise always waits until the last minute to buy te- tickets, which is always super stressful for me as the producer. Mm-hmm. But uh, it'll be fine. I've already they've already sold enough tickets to pay all the comics and stuff. So nice. That'll be fun. And then on the twelfth, which is actually only uh, the Saturday before, because my show's on the Friday. The previous Saturday, I will be at the Lucky Dog with uh, Julie uh, Goodman and uh, Belinda Carroll for a big gay show. She does. It's actually hosted by the Portland Queer uh, Comedy Festival, and that one. So there's a big gay show. At the Lucky Dog at uh, the 12th and on the 18th at the Visual Arts Collective, there is a big atheist show. Ah, oh, very nice. And each show is $15, so uh, go to both if you're a gay atheist. <laughs> the gay atheist. Awesome. The treasured gay atheist. Yeah. And Lauren, thank you for, for trying to power through. With the baby and the dog. With the baby and the dogs. and Yeah, no, it's fine. It's hard. Yeah. Uh, it's very we, difficult. We went long. Uh, a shocker us if if what? you aren't a patron you have missed out on a lot of amazing tangents i know we have so many tangents so guys. become a patron and it's really not even very ex- it. it's so not even very expensive a dollar a month yeah it's a gets dollar you all the extra the co- content. uh i'm assuming a lot of the alien stuff is going because that is some that screamed patron didn't it all of that is, yeah that's all patron yeah that's like 20 minutes stuff. right there <laughs> I We have a lot of thoughts on other uh-huh. intelligences. Mm-hmm. And remember, not all those who wander are lost. 
The podcast you're about to listen to includes cursing and talking about hoo haws. Please be advised. DOG, DOJ. Okay, the DOG wants out.